Hello and welcome to the Center for International Development's Friday Speaker Series. My name is Dara Malaikin and I'm a sophomore at Harvard College and a CID student ambassador. I'm beyond excited to moderate for today's discussion entitled The Frontlines of Peace, an Insider Guide to Changing the World. The format for today's session will be a 20 to 25 minute presentation followed by around 20 minutes for Q&A. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Given that this is a hybrid event, we will be taking in-person and virtual questions. I'll be walking around with a mic for the in-person questions and our CID faculty and program assistant, Claire McCarthy, will be, will be taking questions from the virtual audience. We're also recording today's session, but we'll keep the camera on our speaker and ensure that only voices from the audience will be recorded. The video of this event will be available on the CID YouTube channel following the event. Finally, our next speaker series is on Friday, October 21st at 12 p.m. Eastern time with Melin Tembe presenting AI for social impact, results from deployments from public health and conservation. We hope you'll join us. And without further ado, I'm honored to introduce our speaker for today, Severine Otuser. Severine is an award-winning peace builder, author, and researcher, as well as a professor and chair for political science at Bernard College, Columbia University. She's the author of The Front Lines of Peace, Peace Land, and The Trouble with Congo, in addition to articles for publications such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, Foreign Affairs, and Foreign Policy. Odisera has been involved intimately in the world of international aid for more than 20 years. She's conducted research in 12 different conflict zones from Colombia to Somalia to Israel and the Palestinian territories. She's worked for Doctors Without Borders in places like Afghanistan and Congo and the United Nations headquarters in the United States. Her research has helped shape the intervention strategies for several United Nations departments, foreign affairs ministries, and non-governmental organizations, as well as philanthropists and activists. She's been a featured speaker at the World Summary of Nobel Peace Laureates, the United States House of Representatives, and the United Nations Security Council. Thank you all for joining us, and over to you, Sabrine. Thank you so much, Dara, for this very, very kind introduction. Thank you, Claire, for all your work organizing this event. And thanks to all of you for joining us, uh, both in person in this beautiful campus and online today. It's absolutely wonderful to meet so many people who share Dara's and my wish to create a world where all can thrive. And I'm absolutely thrilled to talk with you about my new book, The Front Lines of Peace. It's a really important topic because you know that more than 2 billion people currently live under the threat of violence in more than 50 conflict zones around the world. So peace building is a crucial task for many states and international institutions. And when I say peace building, I really mean any and all actions that help promote peace before, during, and after a conflict. But the thing is that our templates and techniques for approaching war and peace just don't work. Afghanistan, Colombia, Congo, Syria, Ukraine, Myanmar, we've read the same stories many times before. There was violence. The United Nations got involved. Then our countries pledged millions in assistance. Warring parties called for ceasefires, they signed agreements, they held elections, and the headlines praised peace. And then, uh, a week or two later, sometimes just days later, violence flares up again. Often, uh, it had never actually ended. And in many cases, it lasted for years after. You know that more than half of all ongoing wars have already lasted for more than 20 years? In just the, the past five years, wars have spawned the worst refugee crisis since World War II. Our newspapers keep running headlines like the ones that you now see on my slides. And when you talk with inhabitants of war-torn countries, you see that they are fed up with the apparent inability of governments, peacekeepers, and international institutions to stem the flood of violence. And there has been plenty of discussion about what has gone wrong when we've tried to stop wars in the past. But now, I think it's time to ask, what has gone right. And 
It turns out that elections don't build peace and democracy itself may not be the golden ticket, at least not in the short term. Contrary to what most politicians preach, building peace doesn't require billions in aid or massive international interventions. Instead, it often involves giving power to ordinary citizens. Ultimately, many successful examples of peace building in the past few years have involved innovative grassroots initiatives led by local people and sometimes supported by foreigners like the South African peacekeeper you now see with me in the photo, often using methods shunned by the international elite. So rather than focusing on abstract peace agreements and handshakes between presidents and negotiations between governments and rebel leaders, the front lines of peace details the concrete everyday actions that actually make a difference on the ground. So some of these are bizarre, some are creative, some involve age old traditions, and some are just common sense. My book explains how peace building can actually work so that we can finally improve the lives of billions of people. And I show that to end violence from war and also to address violent conflicts at home, whether home is Boston, Paris, or New York, Bogota, Lagos, or Fort de France, we have to fundamentally change the way we view and build peace. And I make this argument by building on 20 years of more than 20 years of work in 12 different war zones. So in the countries you now see in red on my map, as well as more than 800 in-depth interviews that I conducted with uh, peace builders, politicians, uh, warlords, survivors, local populations, and outside observers. So here, you see me conducting interviews and here I'm conducting participant observations. So I was really happy that day. I thought, yeah, I'm fitting in, I'm such a good ethnographer. But the thing is that I'm not a man and there were only men on this military base. And also I thought that there was something wrong with my bulletproof jacket. I went patrolling with the peacekeepers for several hours and the bulletproof jacket was really heavy. It was super uncomfortable and it didn't protect my heart or my heart or any of my vital organs. And it's only when we were back to the base that one of the Indian officers comes to me and say, hmm, you know you've been wearing it backward. <laughs> anyway, I still got really good material that day. <laughs> so in the book, in the front lines of peace, I first tell the stories of grassroots activists, ordinary people, uh, local leaders, and foreign interveners who did manage to make a difference in war zones. Then uh, I describe the limitations of the conventional way to build peace, which I call Peace Inc., and which relies on governments, elites, and foreign peace builders, and usually excludes ordinary people and grassroots activists. Building on these stories, I suggest a better way to help reestablish peace in war zones around the world. And the conclusion shows how residents of ostensibly peaceful countries, like in North America and in Europe, can use the lessons from the book to decrease violent tensions at home, ranging from inner city conflicts to political and religious divide. So let me tell you the story of Idri, which is quite literally an island of peace in Congo. For the past 30 years, one of the deadliest conflicts has raged around Idri. And despite the presence of one of the largest and most expensive peacekeeping mission in the world, several million people have died. Hundreds continue to die every day. But Idri itself has avoided mass violence. So the island is stunningly beautiful, as you can see in one of the photos I took one day when I was there. But what makes the place even more noteworthy and the peace uh, 
even more surprising, and actually surprising, is that the island contains all of the same preconditions that have led to extensive violence in other parts of Congo. So you have a geostrategic location. As you can see on my map, Itri is located right at the border between Congo and Rwanda, two countries that have been at war regularly since the 1960s. You also have um, ethnic tensions, natural resources, extreme poverty, um, local conflicts over land and traditional power, and many other features that have caused extensive fighting in the neighboring provinces. And what's fascinating about Idri is that the island is peaceful because of the active everyday involvement of all of its citizens, including the people you see on my slide, and including the forest and the least powerful one. So it's not the state, the police, or the army who manage to control tensions, and it's not foreign peace builders either. It is the members of the community themselves. And they do this by fostering what they call a culture of peace by organizing in grassroots associations and local structures that help resolve conflicts, and by trying on very strong beliefs that help deter violence by both outsiders and insiders, um, such as blood packs. Blood packs are traditional promises between two parties who promise never to hurt each other. And the story of Idri shows us that local community resources can build peace better than the usual elite agreements and outside interventions. And foreign peace builders can help in this process. So take the teams of the Life and Peace Institute in Congo. LPI is a Swedish peace building organization that is uh, involved in various conflict zones and usually focuses on working at the grassroots. And the LPI Congo team bases its actions on in-depth local expertise, and they reject universal approaches to peace building. They rely on local employees supervised by a few foreigners, and these foreigners often have extensive pre-existing country knowledge. LPI doesn't implement programs directly. Instead, it works with and through a few hand-picked local organizations and the main role of these organizations is to support local people on the ground. These local organizations empower ordinary citizens to develop their own analysis of their community's conflict, decide on the best solutions, like for example, they are doing now in the photo on my slide, and then implement those solutions. So you see the difference with the usual way to build peace in war zones. In the LPI model, it's not foreigners based in headquarters and capital cities who conceive, design, and implement peace building programs. It's not national or provincial elites either, and it's not the state or the government. Instead, it is the members of the community themselves, including ordinary people, who conceive, design, implement peace building programs with the help of LPI and its local partners. So I'm gonna tell you a story so that you can see how it actually works in practice. For years, there was a deadly conflict in the Ruzizi Plain in Eastern Congo. And it led to a lot of death, a lot of suffering, and the involvement of local militias, uh, the Congolese government, and even Rwandan armed groups. And in 2007, three Congolese organizations decided to help address these tensions with the help of LPI. And so for three years, they focused on understanding what the problem was. They organized a lot of small and large meetings, and in these meetings, they included everyone. Politicians, ordinary citizens, 
um, army officers, soldiers, rebel leaders, civil society activists, uh, farmers, ministers, women groups, etc. And they progressively realized that the conflict was not so much a proxy war between Congo and Rwanda, as we interveners thought at the time, but rather it was a conflict between farmers and herders. Because cattle often destroyed crops, the farmers retaliated by killing the herders, whose families reached out to local militias who went on to attack the farmers' communities, and so on and so forth. So all of the people involved, the ordinary citizens, the combatants, they all designed solutions that they thought would work to address the problems that they viewed at the root of the violence. So for instance, they established routes for moving cattle with minimal disruptions to farmer. They erected, erected public signposts to clearly mark the route that the herders should take with their cattle. They also established mediation committees so that representatives of both herders and farmers could smooth out any tensions that may arise. Because you know, with cattle, even with this kind of very, very clear signs, you can't always make sure that they stay on the right path. So of course, there were challenges, issues, problems. But to make a long story short, while all of the elite agreements and outside interventions had never really made a difference before, local residents saw tangible results once LPI and its local partners got involved. For years, the seasonal migration of cattle took place with very little violence. Dozens of militiamen handed in their weapons, and ethnic groups that were fighting slowly started working and living together. For instance, they started sharing the same market. So outsiders can help reestablish peace. But the catch is that to really help, they can't continue acting the way they usually do. Because there are countless limitations with the conventional way to build peace, which I call Peace Inc., and which relies on governments, elites, and foreign peace builders, and usually excludes uh, ordinary citizens and grassroots activists. So the Peace Inc. Uh, conventional approach to peace building relies on misleading and detrimental assumptions, um, like the idea that only top-down intervention can end armed violence. The idea that all good things come together. So for instance, that elections will naturally lead to peace. And the idea that only outsiders have the required skills and expertise to build peace. So I'm more than happy to elaborate on the problems with our standard approach to peace during the Q&As, if you're interested. But I'd rather use the five, 10 minutes that I have left uh, to tell you how we can change that. Because I really think that we need to learn from success stories instead of always focusing on issues, challenges, and failures. So these past few years, I've looked for cases of what I call unlikely peace. Places where everything cons conspires to cause violence, and yet somehow you have peace, like in Ijwi. And I've found places like that all over the world, in Afghanistan, Colombia, Congo, Israel and the Palestinian territory, Iraq, Iraq um, Somalia, like for example, in the two villages where I took the photos you now see on my slide. And the example I like best is the story of Somaliland. So there is a really interesting contrast between, on the one hand, Somalia, which is extremely violent, has some of the highest rankings in some of the world's least desirable categories. So most corrupt country, second most failed state, etc. And on the other hand, you have this autonomous region in the north of Somalia that is called Somaliland. That went through a devastating independence war 
with Somalia in the late 1980s and in the 1990s, a war that destroyed nearly 90% of the towns, some of which still haven't been rebuilt, as you can see in the photo I took when I was there a few years ago. But for the past 25 years, Somaliland has experienced little violence, little terrorism, and it now has a well-functioning state. Decent public services, as you can see in my photo of the capital, Hargeza, and even some kind of functioning democracy. And of course, there are many reasons for the difference between uh, Somalia and Somaliland. But the main one is that the usual top-down, outsiders-led approach prevailed in the rest of Somalia, while Somaliland benefited from sustained grassroots peace-building initiatives that were led by insiders, by Somalilanders themselves, just like the people you see in my photos. And so the case of Somaliland shows us that local people can help promote peace, not only on a small scale, like in Ijwi, but also over a large territory and a quasi-state. And the good news is that we can support this kind of efforts without falling into the same old tired relationships between insiders and outsiders and without destroying local peace efforts as interveners so often do. Because there are role models that we can learn from. In my research, I found a lot of original, out-of-the-box approaches by interveners who did manage to make a difference, both at the highest elite level and also on the ground. And I talk about these people a lot in the book. They are named uh, Vijaya Thakur, Peter Van Holden, Lemak Bowie, James Camberry, Banu Altumbas. I, I could go on and on. They come from all over the world and they work for very different organizations in very different countries. But they have a few things in common. They don't think that as outsiders, they know better, that they have the right theory, skills, and expertise, or that they bring the ideal solutions to people's problems. Instead, uh, they respect local residents, they listen to them, and they're humble. They understand that other people may have a different understanding of peace, democracy, and development, and different priorities. They also know the local context well. They speak at least some of the local languages and they have extensive local networks. They're in it for the long run. They stay on site for years, sometimes decades. They don't place themselves at the forefront of peace efforts and they don't put their logos everywhere, but instead they remain low profile and they turn the spotlight on the achievements of their local partners local organizations, local staff, local authorities. They're flexible. They keep adapting their strategies based on the results and feedback that they get and the way the situation evolves. And lastly, they understand that sometimes there are hard choices to be made because all good things do not go to be together. So sometimes we may have to choose between worthy goals. So for instance, between peace and justice, or between peace and democracy. And the best interveners understand that they shouldn't be the ones who make these choices. The people who have to live with the consequences of a decision should be the ones making it. And to conclude, there is one last thing that I'd like to mention. All of these ideas, all of these lessons from conflict zones can help us address not only tensions in war zones around the world, but also political, ethnic, and religious conflicts here at home in, uh, you know, in ostensibly peaceful places like uh, Boston or other parts of North America and Europe. And I'm more than happy to talk more about that during the discussion if you're interested. And of course, our elected representatives also have an important role to play because as we all know, uh, sustainable peace lasts only when it's built from the top down and from the bottom up. 
But whether they're working at the top or at the grassroots, whether uh, here or abroad, we certainly need more individuals like the inhabitants of Ijwi and more organizations that work like the Life and Peace Institute. We certainly need more programs that follow the basic principles that I've told you about. Because it's with organizations and programs like these that we can help the one, the two billion people who live under the threat of violence in conflict zones around the world, and that we can also improve the situations in our own communities. So of course, uh, all of these ideals are not magic ones, but because they take into account deeply rooted causes of conflict, they can definitely be game changers. So if you want to know more, uh, please feel free to ask a question now. Uh, Q&As are always my favorite parts of this kind of events. Uh, you can uh, also, afterwards, you can follow me on social media. So I'm the most active on Twitter, but I also have the usual Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn account. Uh, I have put the uh, full text uh, of all of my articles online on free access, and they're accessible via my website. Uh, severinautosur.com and I've also put there a lot of resources that uh, I find I think you may enjoy and of course my three books have a lot more ideas uh, details and stories about everything that I've been telling you today um, and so and I actually consider the front lines of peace to be the best of my three books so I'd be <laughs> really honored if you would check it out and I have a discount flyer here, and I understand that for, for the Zoom people, Claire is also circulating it online. So thank you so much, everyone, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion.